Thank you very much uh, for this kind introduction. And it is really my, my pleasure to be here and to give you an overview about the Human Brain Project. Um, I'm a physician and uh, I also studied biophysics, uh, but as a neuroscientist, uh, I found it uh, always key really, um, not only to promote neuroscience and get more insights into the brain, but bring this, uh, bring this to patients. And the HPP is a framework where we try to do precisely this. So let me give you a very quick overview. Uh, so we, uh, that is 122 partners from 17 countries in Europe, more than 500 scientists, engineers, students, technicians are directly involved in this project. We have 23 associated members, a large number of partnering projects. Uh, these are partners who uh, join the project with their own money, with their own idea and research projects and, and seek collaboration in the project. Um, up to now, we have about 1,600 scientific publications with, with really nice insights uh, into human brain organization, but also going to, to medicine and new technology. Um, all you know that this is a very large project. It's a 10 years duration. And the estimated EU funding of this flagship project is 406 million euro. Um, we are developing eBrains, uh, which is now selected to the S3 roadmap 2021. And uh, uh, Pavel Sviboda will in the next talk uh, speak more about it. Um, so what is a flagship? What's our idea? Our vision is to deepen the understanding of the human brain uh, structure and function by building this research infrastructures that harnesses multiple disciplines and computing and advances science, ICT and medicine. Um, our research focus in the last three years, that is 22 to 23, is a connect home. So the totality of all connections and the mechanisms behind its variability, uh, the role of the connectome for cognition and consciousness and as adaptive architectures for cognitive functions. Our strategy uh, to uh, realize the vision is co-design. So what is meant as co-design? Co-design means that we start from a very concrete neuroscientific question, then develop together with engineers and informaticists tools and instruments, more precisely here also e-brains, we as neuroscientists contribute high quality data and our own tools. We also test it, use it for our own research question and help others to use it so that it becomes a truly European effort. And this meeting today uh, is one of the uh, very concrete meetings uh, where, where we try to, uh, to open up the project in such a way that, that you as neurologist uh, or clinical neuroscientist uh, can better understand what this um, infrastructure eBrains is good for and, and what you could do. So we have made eBrains openly accessible already now um, to the international research community um, and um, it will be available for long term. So it's really now the time also to discuss uh, in the broader science community what do we need as scientists um, which instruments do we need? What is our vision and uh, what are the, the prerequisites? eBrains is our platform um, that we are developing in the HPP um, together. And it is aiming uh, to provide very practical support for users, for researchers mainly, uh, in different domains. And they are listed here, it concerns data and knowledge atlases, simulation tools, brain-inspired technologies, and medical data analytics. And everything is available. You can go to the website and uh, click through the different categories and, and see what is, what is offered there. Um, but how can it help you uh, to study brain disorders? And this is uh, the focus here in my talk. And of course, there are lots of possibilities and you will uh, learn more in the two days uh, what concretely the options are in, in the field of the medical informatics platforms, uh, data sciences, and so on and so forth. So what I'm trying to do is instead of give you a very broad overview about the whole project, which would be really in a uh, uh, almost a, a task that is not feasible to, to be achieved, I would like to give you examples of ongoing research. So what has been already achieved 
with eBrains um, in the HPP, but also to illustrate what is the potential for future research in brain medicine. So really looking forward to what could be done in the next few years. And uh, I would like to present you examples which could serve as role models, as blueprints uh, for your own research. It's not the complete picture, obviously, um, but it uh, is aimed to, to stimulate your own research and your, uh, make your interest. And if you would like to have a more systematic overview about the project, uh, then I would like to uh, point to, uh, to a paper that came out in 2018 in PLOS Biology, where we have very systematically um, identified uh, our neuroscientific goals and, and what the infrastructure is behind and, and how we approach the, the different questions. So let me give you a first example um, of, uh, of research in the Human Brain Project that is done uh, in Amsterdam and Peter Rolfsemer's lab, who is developing a new prothesis for the blind. And, and here, several aspects uh, come together. Um, and um, I find this research so exciting because it brings um, an, uh, a perspective for those uh, who are blind um, that new um, um, electrodes can be implanted um, and deep learning, machine learning can be used in order to process information that is being detected um, uh, through, through a camera and that really helps to translate visual information, visual perception uh, and, and transfers it into brain signals. And it's an example also where many things are coming together, like uh, uh, machine learning work, such as done in Maastricht and Amsterdam. There is uh, anatomical work about the architecture of visual areas and their connectivity, uh, also in collaboration between Amsterdam and Jülich. There's a knowledge graph in the background that we need to, to handle all the data. And, and make them um, ready to, to be processed uh, in, this, um, in this model. And there are, of course, developments uh, in electro technology. And Peter Rolfsema uh, is uh, now publishing uh, in the last few years uh, quite interesting uh, papers about how, um, how shape perception can be realized via high channel count neuroprothesis in the monkey visual cortex, but they are also uh, first um, first data about visual percepts in the human brain. So that could really um, revolutionize uh, the prothesis, uh, which have been for a long time on the agenda of, of uh, technology and, and brain research, uh, but still the results are, are not so good. What we see here is um, that really using these devices, um, monkeys can recognize um, certain pattern, identified letter, for example, and identify scenes. So that would be a major progress um, uh, when we will be able uh, to really make it usable for patients. Let me give you a second example, which comes from Rainer uh, Goebel in Maastricht. So um, he's a researcher that is analyzing networks that are involved in the control of visual motor integration. And when we are doing functional imaging, um, we can uh, identify such networks as they are uh, drafted here in, in the left part of the image. So we more and more understand what are the prerequisites and what is the processing of information from one area to another in order to move hands and uh, to coordinate hand movement and, and tool option. So what Rainer did was he has put this into a scheme and has uh, made from these neuroimaging derived networks, a mathematical description of networks and model of the frontoparietal um, uh, areas that are involved in visual motor processing. And um, it could be uh, a basis for future hand or arm prothesis. Um, and the way to it is to develop a virtual robotic hand, as you can see it here. So this is a simulated hand, but in the background of the algorithms that are responsible uh, for the movement that you see are very concrete functional imaging uh, results. And the task that this hand has to fulfill here is uh, to move the cube in such a way that it in the most fastest way uh, and also in the most accurate uh, way moves the cube uh, according to the image on the left-hand side. And this is, of course, extremely important, uh, not only for 
future prothesis. But also, if you think about uh, autonomous uh, robots, where also such coordination uh, should be implemented in, in technical devices. Let me give you another example or a series of examples uh, coming from the Human Brain Atlas. And, and we in Jülich and Düsseldorf are developing Jülich Brain as a high resolution uh, atlas of human brain areas of the cerebral cortex, but also of subcortical structures. So um, the Jülich Brain Atlas uh, provides um, almost 200 areas at this moment. It is part of the eBrains infrastructure. And through this eBrains infrastructure, it is possible to link the cytoarchitectonic atlas to other brain data, for example, from neuroimaging, um, and to other tools and instruments, for example, simulation, visualization, or, or other types of analysis. And um, the way the atlas is built is illustrated here. Um, and this atlas again is available. So we start from histological sections of human brains, uh, stain them for cell bodies, as you can see it here. Uh, we also develop algorithms that help us to identify single cells and delineate them from each other according to their shape. And these um, images of high resolution uh, histological sections um, have a resolution of one to 20 micrometer resolution. And the architecture, that is the way how cells are distributed in the human brain, is different in dependence from where you are in the brain and what the function of these areas are. And our big brain model is an anatomical model at 20 micrometer resolution, which allows you, like in a Google Earth, uh, to zoom into the brain and uh, to see the details of the regional cellular architecture. And then link to these details uh, certain other features. So for example, with colleagues in, in Oxford, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, identified cortical layers and cortical layers are very important when we want to understand feed forward and feed uh, back uh, information processing. We have identified cortical areas like here the primary visual cortex and can link other data like receptor data. So eBrands gives an environment that allows through the knowledge graph to link all these different uh, elements, which is other, and also to link it to the medical informatics platform, which I find extremely important uh, for, for the future. Um, because we would like to use this data to, to better analyze uh, patients' data. And this is a, an example that came out this year. So here we analyzed um, um, normal subjects, control subjects from a large cohort, the thousand brain studies, and picked out um, some subjects which had uh, uh, which were uh, in dementia screening relatively low. And these are the, the colored circle, patient one, two, three, four, five. And the, the light gray ones, these are the, the control subjects. And um, then we asked the questions uh, based on the thousand brain, what are the lifestyle profiles of these um, of these page of these of these people uh, that have this very low uh, dementia screen test? And um, lifestyle means here alcohol consumption, body mass index, uh, whether um, they have a certain dietary, whether they are smoking, what their uh, their social uh, inclusion is, uh, and so on and so forth. So they are and uh, how much they are. Um, active uh, with respect to, to physical exercises. And what you see on the right side is uh, that these profiles are quite different uh, of these four uh, subjects. Um, and um, that some, so to say, are of course, very heavy weighted, other are more light, uh, and, and they have different, so to say, different environmental conditions uh, according to the lifestyle. And then uh, we have asked the question uh, when we compare their brains, their structural imaging data, uh, with those of healthy controls, where do we see um, deviations uh, from the normal range? And the normal range, these are the light gray, uh, these are the light gray uh, lines that you can see here, and the, the colored peaks, these are our four male subjects. And you see that they have quite different um, deviations from, uh, from, from the normal distribution, uh, but there are certain brain areas, for example, here in, in Broca's region, or here in the parietal cortex, or in the somatosensory cortex, where one or the other patient uh, 
is uh, clearly different uh, from the normal distribution. And we can have a closer look uh, to these areas where paper sh paper, um, people show differences. And um, these four areas are here uh, projected to the human brain. And then we can use eBrains and ask the question, what are the receptor profiles that we would expect uh, in, in these areas? Or what is the ARCOE expression? Uh, that we can link uh, to these particular areas. What is the structural connectivity? So the idea is um, that we can um, use ATLAS information and information that is stored uh, in the knowledge graph in order to better characterize the networks of very concrete and uh, uh, specific individuals. What we see is that the individual profiles uh, of normal subjects and also of patients um, are quite variable in, in all domains. And of course, this has consequences when we think about uh, um, um, uh, their, their prognosis and when we think about possible therapies. We see similarities, but also dissimilarities uh, in the pattern of brain atrophies that can help us to um, explain the phenomena that we observe on the behavioral level. And uh, we feel that such approaches could really go towards individual predictions. And I'm, I'm certain that the MIP uh, can play uh, precisely a role also in, uh, in this endeavor that is come from average uh, data to, to individual uh, predictions um, that can be used for, uh, for individual patients in the future. Let me give you another example. Um, when we are looking um, to the receptor distribution pattern in the human brain, then we see that they are area specific and they are also layer specific. And we see differences between different receptor types for different neurotransmitter systems. And we have here selected two areas, uh, primary motor cortex, area 4P, and one area in effusiform gyrus. And uh, reflected are the uh, receptor distribution pattern uh, of, of dopamine. And we can model these receptor distributions as uh, can be seen on the right-hand side. We do not have the data for all brain regions, but we have them for many. And um, then we can use uh, these models of receptor densities and compare it uh, with uh, the bold signal that we can observe in normal subjects and patients with Parkinson's disease uh, during uh, uh, a challenge study using methylphenidate uh, and in a bold experiment, an fMRI experiment. And uh, Roshan Kuhls from Amsterdam did this is very cool study. And uh, it's interesting uh, to see that the D1 receptor distribution really assembles uh, some, of the uh, some of the activations that we can see in this challenge study. And this is interesting because it helps us uh, to better explain the effects uh, of drugs that uh, may uh, act on different receptor types uh, um, to very concrete receptors. So pharmacological challenges during learning could be better explained using receptor data that we have uh, collected uh, in the eBrain's research infrastructure and uh, the, the human brain atlas is so to say the window that helps you to specifically look uh, to these uh, changes. Another example um, is the so-called virtual brain, which is a simulation environment developed by Victor Josa, Randy McIntosh, Petra Ritter and others. Uh, and that helps to uh, uh, develop individualized brain models of patients based on their own neuroimaging studies, for example, uh, diffusion uh, tensor imaging data and uh, MEG data on the one hand, and then uh, using ATLAS data, for example, uh, cellular distributions and area distributions based on the big brain data set. And then uh, high performance computing resources are needed in order to compute uh, these models and the models are individualized and they should help uh, neurosurgeons uh, to, to better prepare uh, for epilepsy surgery. And the first clinical trial is now ongoing uh, in, in Paris and uh, Marseille, sorry, with, with more than 400 subjects participating. So we hope that also uh, simulation in the near future can help uh, to, to develop personalized uh, models uh, and uh, come to personalized uh, surgery. Another application um, comes from the comparison uh, of uh, gene expression data with cytoarchitecture. 
And uh, gene expression data can be analyzed in postmortem brains. And this has been done in particular in the brain, in the Allen Brain Institute uh, in Seattle. We have developed the Jülich Brain Atlas with cytoarchitectonic areas. So we have developed a tool together that helps to superimpose gene expression data of some candidate dates, genes with uh, cytoarchitectonic areas. And this uh, superimposition helps us to better understand not only what is a normal function of these two areas in the frontal pole, for example, FP1 and FP2, but also to understand what is their contribution, for example, to better understand major depression. And indeed, this uh, example helped us uh, to identify uh, genes that are important for uh, upregulating um, uh, factors that are involved uh, in, uh, transmitter, in neurotransmitter receptors and that help uh, to explain the pathogenesis of major depression here precisely. And this UGEX tool is also accessible in eBrains as many, many other tools and not only as a tool that can be clicked and viewed, but uh, it is embedded into an environment that allows you to apply a Python scripts or MATLAB script to download the data. And this is so key because it allows uh, to upscale uh, the analysis and not only, so to say, to do it uh, step by step uh, in a very, in, in a manual way. Let me give at the end uh, some examples uh, how the, the Atlas and the eBrains infrastructure can help you to better understand the relationships between uh, brain structure and function. And brain structure can be seen uh, in MRI, but not at the level of microstructural brain areas. Microstructural brain areas can only be seen under the microscope, but here we are lacking, of course, the, the functional um, um, involvement of the areas. So what is the, the solution? So we are mapping cytoarchitectonic areas in many histological and serial sections, as you can see it here, uh, develop maps that, uh, that are uh, indicated here, and then can superimpose the cytoarchitectonic parcellations with functional imaging studies, for example, targeting visual spatial uh, processing or episodic memory. And we find really new uh, insights regarding the differentiation of uh, the visual cortex and, and also the specialization, for example, within this PPA area. So that's one, ex, uh, one example. And the other is uh, with function uh, MECAM analysis. That's a way how to analyze the functional connectivity of brain areas. And usually when you do this type of analysis, uh, there are different blobs in the brain. Uh, but behind the blobs, there are many different areas and they are functionally different. So using the ATLAS, um, we, we have a much better understanding what are the precise networks um, that are involved uh, uh, as a result of these uh, MECM analysis. So the idea is really uh, to develop an ATLAS and, and bring ATLASing to the 21st century that is capable to answer questions uh, coming from neuroimaging studies of patients and of healthy human subjects and integrate uh, all kinds of information using the ATLAS as a prior and, and therefore making the many, many data that we have collected in the Human Brain Project available and useful for you. And uh, on the left side, you see some of the applications here for one area. Um, you, uh, you get an overview, what, what is this kind of area? What is it doing? What is the connectivity of this area in particular? What is the receptor architecture and so on and so forth. So it's uh, also a very large database that is now uh, being developed in, in the Human Brain Project and uh, where, so to say, tools are coming together to answer your own research question. So thank you for your attention. And uh, of course, you are more than welcome to join us and explore together the opportunities that we will have in the future. Thank you.